everybody, and welcome to the Board Game Mechanic. I'm Katie, and with me, as always, is... Hey guys, what's going on? It is Jason. <laughs> so, Jason is the only part of the as always that is as always. <laughs> I'm sure you're all, um, if you're in the Riveted, if you're following us on Facebook, you saw Joel's little video about taking some time away, working on stuff in his life. And um, we're really thankful that he's been a part of this and we want him to do what is best for Joel. And if that means stepping back from the board game mechanics, you know, we, we totally support that. And we just want to reiterate, at least I do, that we love Joel, like, um, we've been friends for a long time and we will continue to be no matter if he's on a podcast or not. Yeah, I agree. I posted something on the page a few days ago saying that, you know, I was thankful for the couple of years that he put into this. He really helped build the brand and he helped me actually learn how to do a podcast, which was awesome. So I learned a lot about games from Joel. He was a great co-host. He's a good friend. So hopefully he gets some of his, his stuff in order so we can get back to gaming and have a good time. Yeah, so um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Katie. I'm actually Jason's wife. And for the time being, I'll be filling in the spot of Joel. My banter is definitely not a zany. And uh, I don't know as many donkey fart jokes as Joel, but I will do my best to try and <laughs> keep things lively compared to the straight man that is Jason. He doesn't know the donkey fart jokes either. He makes it up. <laughs> okay, that's good. I asked Jason if I should like come to the show intoxicated. So I would be like more zany like Joel. And he told me that was not an option. So already I'm being oppressed on the on the podcast. Yeah. Um. So one thing we do need to mention up top, it's not super zany, but um, Proto Spiel, we have a promo code. It was effective as of January 1. So since this podcast came out after January 1. It's effective. And the code is riveted with a capital R. If you don't know how to spell riveted, then we got some issues with you. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. You'll have trouble finding us on Facebook and other places. Yeah. So, yeah, um, you can go to their website and put that in. There's a link to the website on our Facebook page, actually, that'll take you where you need to go to get tickets if you're interested. So, I'm going to try to be there at least one day. I, well, hopefully, Katie will too. That's the goal. I don't know if I'll be there any, we'll be there any more than that. So, one day, hopefully, probably not more. Jason's too busy living the rock star dream and his band is playing that Friday night. So that makes it a little logistically difficult for us to go to South Bend, but we will definitely try to be up there at least on Saturday. So hopefully we'll see you there. It's a great um, gathering way to s support other people in the hobby who are trying to make great games and just kind of get out there. So don't forget that code riveted. Yeah. You know, that rock star dream where you spend so many hours, way into the wee hours of the morning, playing playing songs of other people making $2 sometimes. Yeah, it's good times. Where you spend all your money on your equipment, and then you make $5, and you played for three people, while your wife has to sit behind some drunk woman who's dancing, and she smells like cigarette smoke when she tries to show up to church the next day. Yep, that dream. Yep. The best way to become a millionaire when you're in a band is to start as a billionaire. <laughs> For sure. All right. So we're going to move on to some quick news. And then we have a new topic that we're going to start. I don't know. We'll figure it out. But a new segment. Yeah. New segment. Yeah. We're going to the news. All right. So Katie was looking on Kickstarter and she found a game that looked really neat. So we decided we would talk about it. And that game is called Throne of Allegoria, or I think that's how you say it. Uh, it's from Game Brewer and Spielworks. Uh, I think Game Brewer is doing the American distribution and Spielworks is in Europe. Uh, it's on Kickstarter now. It has 20 days to go. And the base pledge is $65. So essentially what this game is, is you're bidding for action order. So you're bidding for these eight different action spots. And based on how high you bid to the lowest is going to determine when you get to go take the action. And I think whoever goes first gets a stronger action. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to get these resources to fulfill these contracts for nobles. <laughs> nobles. And just get more points than everybody else. It didn't have a ton about how to play the game. It just had a little, like, one-page spiel. So I know there's nobles, I know there's bidding, and I know there's going to a worker placement space. Well, this is also essentially they're taking a Spielworks game that already exists, and they're trying to make it like a language-independent version. So it exists already. Um, but they're making it so that everyone can play it. And so they've got like some upgraded components as well to make it a little more deluxe. Um, because this is, who is putting this out? Um, Spielworks. No, but Game Brewer. 
That's the American distribution. Yes. So Gambrera is making it so like there's one big game board. So these two separate boards, cards and components are language independent. They've got some custom shaped meeples and other components, which I love. And they're like rewriting the rule book. Um, the thing I like about this is since Jason won't talk about it, the theme of it is um, the throne is basically up for grabs and they need someone which would be you, the queen is is dying. And so there are these four houses that are like vying to champion and take over. And so you have to do different, and it seems like a lot of different things to get you to be the one to win that. So you're using the local workforce. You're like doing some kind of area control. You're doing some winning of battles. Um, there's like six rounds. So it seems like that would flow pretty quick. And then at the end, if you have the most influence, which is how you're crewing points, I guess, you win the game. I think it sounds really fun, but I'm sure Jason will not back it because it breaks the $40 limit. $65. That's crazy. I mean, it looks beautiful and awesome, but... It looks awesome. Yeah, $65 is a little bit high. But if, like us, you like nobles, you like shaped meeples, you like Spielworks, check out Throne of Allegoria. Yeah, and I had one more that I wanted to talk about really quickly. Just because he's a friend of the show and he needs to get his game published. And uh, Philip DuBerry, he's in the Riveted group. He comments on some of our stupid posts. And he's a friend of the show. He's been on the show. He just released a game on Kickstarter today at the time of this recording. So on Friday, it'll have about 22 days left. And it's called Square Meal. Um, It's essentially a little card game where you're trying to fulfill these contracts by manipulating the cards to form these patterns. Super hard. Makes me feel really dumb. Uh, I did a video for it. You can check it out on our YouTube. And it's really cheap. It's 18 bucks plus free shipping. So if you like cool little thinky puzzle games and you want to support Philip DuBerry because you do, because he's awesome, he's a great go guy. check that out. Yeah. Um, PDB, I'm sure this is awesome. So if you're listening to this, Jason wouldn't let me play it because he knew I would get mad and feel dumb <laughs> because my brain doesn't work that way. But it looks so cute and you're a great dude. So check that out. Yeah, I told myself I was dumb in the video and then he <laughs> thought that was pretty funny. So. <laughs> Okay, so let's move on to our new segment. Some of you have been in the hobby a long time, and you're used to kind of the terms that we throw around and things we say um, about types of games and what makes a game a certain type or what kind of games you do like or all this lingo. Um, but lots of people that are new to the hobby that may not know them or you just have casually been dipping your your toe into the pool of quote unquote, designer board games. And so there are some terms that get thrown around that might be confusing. So we want to kind of help. We'll explain some. So (laughs) basically what we're going to do is this first section is broken down into a category of builders. So we're going to talk about four types of game mechanisms that are are, have builder in their term. So I'll let Katie start because it's one of her favorite things, and that's an engine builder. So she can tell you a little bit about what that is. I really should have prepped some notes before we got to this part. Um, Engine Builder is a game that you can use cards or tiles or uh, various kinds of means to <clears throat> allow you to generate something over and over again for yourself. It can be points. It can be um, goods. It can be um, extra cards. It can be actions. Um, there are lots of different games that use this, but it's a way that you kind of build an engine, you put into place cards, actions, tiles, whatever the game uses to produce things for yourself each turn. Um, Some games that are engine builders that I really enjoy, um, the popular Wingspan, I would say definitely is an engine builder. Different birds do different things for you. And then when you run your engine, when you kind of select a row that you're going to use that action in, each of the birds will do their specific job producing something for you, thus an engine builder. Um, Lorenzo El Magnifico also has a great engine building component to it. In front of you, you are playing cards down that you're buying from the towers. And when you run the engine, which requires you to place a person some dice there, you will go down your cards and each one will give you something. Another one of my favorite engine builders is London, which is placing cards out in front of you, So that when you decide to run your city, each card will give you something, take away something, all this kind of production happening. So 
It's an engine builder. Yeah. So Katie pr- pretty much, I mean, hit Did that. Did I do a good job? Yeah. yeah you, you killed that one. So to go along with that, which is kind of similar, probably more similar than not, is called a Tableau Builder. So one game that comes to my mind when I think a Tableau Builder is Everdell. So what you're doing is you're trying to acquire these cards and you're putting them down in front of you into like this city. And the city is a certain size. It has a size restriction that you're trying to, you can't go past. And when you place a card, you get to take some actions. It could be a one-time action. It could just be points. So unlike an engine builder, not every card that you put down into this tableau is going to fire every time. It may fire once, could be three or four times over the game, but it fires less, but it just takes up space on your table to restrict you from being able to put other cards down. So that's kind of what I think a tableau builder is, is it's similar to an engine builder, but they don't fire every time. Like when I think of engine builder, I think if I play this card, all six of these other cards are going to fire. Where in Tableau Builder, I could have 15 cards down and only four of them could fire. Which I guess in Wingspan is probably more of a Tableau Builder because it does have cards that are one-time use and you only fire a row at a time. Right. Yeah, I mean, that, I think that one could go both ways for sure. But it is a good mix. But I think it's it might lean a little more toward Engine Builder just because there's more cards to fire than not. And a lot of times those two go hand in hand. You build a Tableau, which makes an engine that you then run to get things. So... Right. So there's some overlap. Yeah. Venn diagram of games. So those are two builders. We have two more that are also kind of similar, but they use different ways to do it. So the first one we'll talk about is a deck builder. And I'll let Katie talk about that one a little bit. And then I'll jump in with the other one that's like a deck builder, but you don't use cards. So deck building is one of my favorite, another one of my favorite (laughs) um, types of games to play. Like the name implies, you are creating a deck, which means you're using cards. Um, And you get cards, you usually buy them, and you put them into your deck to be used later. You have a draw pile and discard pile. So you usually start with some kind of crappy cards in a deck builder. They're basic cards. They don't do things that are so great, but they help you get started. You will play a hand. You will draw your hand limit, which is usually about half what the original deck is. So if it's a 10-card deck, you start with five in your hand. Or if it's eight, you start with four. You know the math. And you'll play those out. When you're done with your turn, those all get discarded. You draw up to your hand limit again from what's left from your draw pile. In a deck builder, you want to build, you want to make a deck have better cards that you can use to win the game. So you want to buy cards that give you more money or cards that have more attack or cards that are helping you get closer to whatever your end goal is. So you're trying to purchase those by using the cards that come up in your hand to get them into your deck so you can play them out. So a deck builder is where you start with a basic set of cards and then you acquire better cards to make a great deck. Yeah. And to go along with that, it's similar almost, except what you're doing is you're going to, it's called a pool builder or a bag builder. It's really a pool builder because you're not building a bag, but whatever. The common term is bag builder. And what you're doing is you're taking these chips and you're putting them into a bag and you would draw chips out to take actions. So a couple of examples of this are Orléans, where you're going to pull some pieces out of this bag to put them onto a board to take actions, to acquire more pieces, to go into your bag. So you're building more actions based on more people that you're acquiring to put in your bag. Another one is Quacks of Quedlinburg, which is same kind of thing. You start out with these really crappy chips. You're pulling them out to get more money to be able to buy better chips to hopefully not keep pulling out the crappy chips. And it's just you're doing building, but instead of using crappy cards to get better cards, you're using crappy chips to get better chips. So they kind of go hand in hand, which is why they're linked together, even though they're very different, but they're similar enough that I thought they could kind of go back to back here. Yeah. I didn't give any examples of deck builders. Uh, Tonto Quarry. Well, I know, but I didn't know if I should. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, I didn't yeah. that. Tonto I mean, Quarry, obviously my favorite deck builder. Um, Marvel Legendary, uh, the classic Dominion, which I actually hate. But I know a lot of people love, and since it's the kind of the foundation of deck building, sure, Dominion. Um, I mean, if you throw a rock, you're going to hit a deck builder. It's, it's true. It's like that. Clank has, is a deck builder that has a board. Has a board. So th- there's different variations on deck building. Um, Rococo is has a deck of cards that you actually are building from, but doesn't work like a typical deck builder. So there's lots of implementations of deck building and bag building that are out there with and without a board or using those as almost like a side mechanism. Yeah. So that was four examples of builders. There's probably a hundred more, but we picked four. Um, Next week we'll come back with something else. 
Sure. If there's something that you want, a term you want to define, us to define, uh, don't make it too hard if we know it. Like, just say a word, and then we'll try to find something that goes with it, like dogs. Yeah, we'll do free word association, (laughs) whatever. Goose, I don't know. Uh, So, if you want to throw some out there in uh, on um, our Facebook group, if you're not part of the Riveted, this is a great chance for you to jump in and be a part of it and send us some terms that you would like to be defined. Um, But those are the builders. Okay, in our next segment, we have received calls from several members of the Riveted already. And I was supposed to be this week, but I felt like it would be weird listening to myself talk to myself. So today we have another super awesome member of the Riveted. And that super awesome member, his name is Tim. We'll leave his last name out because I don't want to get anybody doxxed. So they call Tim. him Tim. So Tim will be telling you about some of his favorite games, and we will let Tim take it over right now. Hey guys, it's Tim from beautiful South Bend, Indiana, and I'm happy to be here to talk to you about some of my favorite games. Uh, First one up is Cthulhu Wars. It has everything I love in a game. Asymmetrical faction, territory control, you're rolling a bunch of dice. And, oh, baby, the minis. There's so much plastic in this game. It's crazy. And I can play, like, big eight-player games. It's so much fun. Did I say minis? So many minis. Uh, another game I love is uh, Belfort. It's an older game, but, man, it's so solid. It's worker placement. You're, you've got elves and dwarves, and you, you're using them to combine resources, and you're trying to build buildings in different districts, and there's some area control and... Uh, the, more, the better you're doing, like the more taxes you have to pay, so it gives the people that are lagging behind a little bit, maybe a little bit of uh, more time and opportunity to catch up. Uh, it's, it's so much fun, and there's a bunch of humor sprinkled in through the game, too, so it's really amazing. Another game that I absolutely love, and it is, it's not complex, it's DC Deck Builder. Uh, there's no theme. There's no theme. It's just a deck builder. It could have sloths and unicorns and bunny rabbits instead of uh, Batman and Superman, and it would do the same thing. That might actually be a better idea. But uh, anyways, it's a great gateway game for me. It's really easy to teach, and it's very accessible because everybody knows the comic book characters. Uh, and then the last game I want to talk to you about is a social deduction game called Wolves of Mercia. And on this one, you've got like a day phase and a night phase, and it's better than just your average like werewolf because it fixes the player elimination problem. You play for five nights, and if you die on one of those nights and it doesn't trigger the end of the game, because that is possible, you actually get a ghost card, which then gives you like a different win condition, or maybe it lets you back in the game. It lets you do other things. So people that are even, even ha- that have been eliminated can still do stuff. So it's tons of fun. It's super cheap. You can order it, and it's probably free shipping if you find it on their website. I'm not a paid sponsor. Uh, but anyway, thank you guys for uh, bearing with me through this. And thanks to the Board Game Mechanics for uh, asking me to be on. I hope to talk to you more soon. Uh, Have a great night. And like they say, keep on gaming. All right. So uh, let's just get this out of the way. (laughs) We should have all known that Tim's first game that he would talk about is Cthulhu Wars. Because he loves that game and he loves miniatures that are bigger than he is. It's ridiculous. Those miniatures are ridiculous. So he told me that he just kind of did it as a joke. I mean, he loves the game, but he also knows his audience that I don't like that game. <laughs> well, I, not that I don't even like it. I'm not going to play it because it has minis. But then he moved on to good games. I'm assuming. I haven't played any of them, actually. No. But Belfort was the second one he talked about. I've actually heard about this one, and I've wanted to play it for a while because I know it's a little bit old school. And I am pretty adamantly against the new hotness, like not in a hipster way, but just I like playing older games. And so I'd like to check this one out. Yeah, it- it looks kind of neat. That's just a worker placement game, I think, but it has a cool theme. Uh, DC Deck Builder, which we could have talked about earlier when we were doing our builders. I didn't want to give it away. Yeah. I want to save something. It has no theme, like Tim said, and it's just, it could be anything. It could be like unicorns and vampires fighting each other. It doesn't really matter. That would be awesome. It's, that w- would be awesome. I agree. And then the game I thought was interesting is a deduction game called The Wolves of Merica. No, Mercia. <laughs> Wolves of Merica would be a totally different game. Like, <laughs> and awesome. Nobody would want to be Trump. Uh, nobody wanted to be like Nancy Pelosi. Like, how would you decide? It would just 
No. Yeah, so it's uh, essentially like he said it was like um, werewolf, but yeah. nobody gets eliminated. It takes place over five rounds, so it seems pretty neat. Maybe I'll have to check that one out. Yeah, it sounds good. Like we have another one of those games, um, the Salem game. Like when even when people die, I think don't you still aren't you still a part of it in some ways? Yeah, yeah, you can still play sort of. I think you can come back to life maybe. But I like I really like social deduction games. I know that's not your favorite thing. So I would love – I've been thinking that we need to have a good kind of one-night werewolf game, and I don't know which one to get. And so this might be one that I would love to check out just to have around when we have lots of people. Because it's called Wolves of America, and that's awesome. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> that's but, the only way Jason will play it. Yeah, sure. It's Wolves of America. We'll get it. Yeah. All right. So I win that one. But yeah, thanks, Tim, for calling in. These are some cool games except for the first one. But, yeah, uh, we'll see who we got on the docket for next week, and we'll move on. All right, so this is Jason's favorite segment, and we're going to talk about games we played. This could get interesting since Jason and I play games together pretty much all the time. But actually, just recently, we have played separately. That's true. It's weird. It's really weird, actually. I've been thinking I need to start like my own like girls only game night. I actually had a friend who expressed interest in that. And I thought that would be really cool. Except I know Jason would be super pissed off because he wouldn't get to play games. And he'd be mad that I was doing it without him. Now I got to believe it. Oh, I can't say that. See, you, you, you knew <laughs> bringing me on the show. It's going to, they're all going to be rated E from now on. Every Board Game Kings podcast is rated E because Katie's on here and she's a filthy. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So to keep Katie from saying more swear words. I'm going to go ahead and get started with uh, the game I played. So a couple weekends ago, we had, well, it was New Year's. We had a, a bunch of people over and we played some games and I was hanging out with some guys playing some games and Katie was playing other games that she'll talk about. Nice. And one game I played is a drafting game and it's pretty new. I think it came out this year and it's called It's a Wonderful World. So the best way to describe this game is it's seven wonders with the drafting. You get seven cards and... What you're going to do, the difference here is you're trying to use cards to either build them using resources that you're going to acquire, or you're going to use the card that you draft to gain resources to put on cards to build them. Once you build a card, it's going to turn into this income generator. And, and when you hit certain points on this board, there's five different kinds of resources. When you generate that resource from your built buildings, if you built the most, you're going to get a supremacy token that worth points at the end of the game. And you're basically just trying to have more goods than everybody else, but you want to also have stuff that you need to build other buildings. So it's a good little give and take of how you're going to use your cards you want to use as a building. You want to use it for resources and all that stuff. Plays over four rounds, just like Seven Wonders. Um, this artwork's pretty neat. It's like a sci-fi theme, which is pretty cool. Uh, I lost real bad. I had eight points. Everybody else had like 80. I don't know what I did, but I had eight points. Uh, other than that, it was still fun to play. The journey was fun. But it was irritating, only scoring eight points. So that was, it's a wonderful life. Yeah, I've never or, heard. No, it's a wonderful, wonderful world. world. <laughs> Jimmy Stewart. Uh, I've never heard of this game until our friends brought it over. And when you told me you only scored eight points, I thought, what in the world happened? So I don't even understand how that's possible. But No um, one does. I suck. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to talk about the game I played that night, and then I have a different game. Um, that night, I played, I had, so... Since I'm married to the king of party games, I don't get to play party games very often when people are, are over. He says, please, let's separate. There's no reason why we should be playing with more than four people. If we have five people, that is a group of two and a group of three. We will never play games for six people and above. So while he was playing It's a Wonderful World, I had a group of six people. And so I dug out a game that I love that he never wants to play. And it's called Monikers. Um, Monikers is actually just kind of a published, formalized version of, of like a living room game called Celebrities that I'm sure many of you have played. Um, so instead of thinking up celebrities to put them on pieces of paper and draw them out of a hat, this is actually um, a set of cards. There's actually um, a couple different expansions and editions. One of them, um, Shut Up and Sit Down, has, I think, their own expansion. And so it's just lists of people. And all kinds of people like Pucks Tony Phil and Lady Godiva and the red shirt and, um, Marie Antoinette 
and the woman who spilled coffee on herself from McDonald's, like all of these. And so everybody picks five. They all go into one pot. You're divided into two teams. And then you have to get to your team to guess as much as you can of that stack in three different rounds. First round, you can say anything you want to get them to say it. You can even read the card itself. Um, and so everyone is hearing these words. Second round, you can only say one word. Third round, you can only do charades. Um, and surprisingly, it was really fun for other people. Like, I know I love it, but sometimes the things I love, other people don't understand, like Shakespeare. Like monikers. It's so good. Um, but everyone had a good time. We played it actually twice in a row. So we did two different times. We switched up teams. Um, the second time was kind of unfair because my sister and I played on the same team and we're only like 18 months apart. So we have this weird kind of brain link where we just get each other so we could like look at each other and I know the word. Um, but it was a really good time. It was fun. It's funny. Like that really helps too. It was just a really good time. So that's monikers. Yeah, I'm glad I got to sit this one out. Uh, I would have rather gotten eight points on It's a Wonderful World than have to play this game. <laughs> Which you did. So... Kudos to you. All right. So another game that I played after I played It's a Wonderful World. It's a wonderful world. Uh, don't. <laughs> Who told you you could sing on this podcast? <laughs> Joel did. <gasps> no, he's not here. Martial law. Uh, so another game I played is called Dicey Peaks. Um, I'm not sure who the publisher is on this. I should have looked that up. I forgot. I thought I knew Cal- Calliope, maybe. I don't know. Katie will look it up. Um, so what this is, this is a push your luck game. Where you're rolling these dice and you're trying to determine if you're going to climb up this mountain to try to get to the top to find a flag. Or if you're going to rest to get oxygen because the farther you move, the more oxygen that you have to use. And if you get down to a certain level of oxygen, you have to pass and you have to waste a turn. But the tricky thing here is once you get to the top of the summit, you're not able to get any more oxygen. So you're trying to balance your oxygen limit when you get pretty close to the top. So you have enough to search three spaces for this flag because there are three tiles at the summit. When you get to the top, you have to pick one, flip it. If it's a flag, you win. If not, then someone else could come up there and beat you to it. So you can't. Yeah, it's it's pretty fun. I love push your luck. So this automatically makes this game better for me. And you're being chased by a Yeti for no reason at all. But whatever. So for no reason. You're on his mountain. Yeah, but it, the, it's this little Yeti like um, like standee. It doesn't even do anything. It doesn't move. It doesn't go anywhere. So what I was doing when we were playing, I would just put it behind the farthest person just so it looked like he was chasing them. It was kind of dumb. But you, you, could roll, <laughs> you could roll Yeti sides of the die, and then whoever's in the back gets scared, and they get to move up for, forward. So it's kind of like a catch-up mechanism. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it was fun. I love Push Your Luck, so this is cool. So Dicey Peaks. Yeah, Dicey Peaks. I love Yetis, and I'm sad that it's a standee because that is a little missed opportunity for, dare I say, a miniature or a shaped meeple. Like, I love Yetis. But the idea of like thinking about going to a mountain and then running out of oxygen makes me really nervous. Like my blood pressure is dangerously high right now. <laughs> Just thinking about it. Like when you said that, I like tensed up. Like it made me scared. Yeah, I think uh, Lauren may have felt like that a couple times too because she took a couple turns just to rest to get oxygen when she was at like six. It goes from zero to nine. You're at six, <laughs> you're fine. I don't. Uh, yeah, I, I feel, I feel her. I understand that. That freaks me out. Okay, so on a different game night, I actually played a game separately from Jason, and it was called Unstable Unicorns, also a game that Jason would never play. Um, my friend got it for her Christmas, a Christmas present, and it's a pretty basic, like, just card game. You're trying to get um, seven, I think, unicorns in front of you in your stable, and each unicorns do different things and then they're like additional like um, upgrades and downgrades to your stable your stable or you can play in other stables and there's nay cards that you can use to like block people from doing things um, that you don't want them to do the thing about this game like I was so ready for this game to be over I have to admit it Um, because it just is not my type of game but what I loved about it the artwork is really cute it's these cute little unicorns um, I also liked, like, the unicorns were funny. Like, there was, like, there there's some basic unicorns. And so, like, they really played up the basic. Like, one of the basic unicorns was, like, pumpkin spice everything. And another one was, like, pop collar. Pop collars are for date nights unicorn. And another one had, like, all these, like, hashtag tweets and stuff on there. It was, it was pretty funny. So, some of the unicorns are really funny and cute. So that was nice. So if you're looking for like a super light game, 
a way to maybe um, start introducing kids to the idea of powers on cards and how they affect other people. This would be like a fun way to get completely non-gamers to look at a game. So that's Unstable Unicorns. Where did you play this? I played it at um, Brian and Josie's church gathering. Oh, yeah. I was thinking the whole time you were talking, I was like, what is she talking about? I play all the time. Things you don't know about. You have no idea the games I play. Evidently not. <laughs> I was struggling. I was like, I don't know what she's talking about. Where'd she play this game? But I, I do remember you picked that up. Okay. I was, uh, <laughs> that was weird. Okay. I have a whole life. You don't know. Secret. That's true. All right. So we'll move on. That's the games we played. And we're going to go talk about something else. All right, so for our kind of meat and potatoes of this podcast today, we want to talk about top gateway games. Now, there are this is a buzzword again, I think, in our in the industry. And so for me, when I was picking out these games, I think we have three piece. Um, when I was picking out my games, I was thinking about games that I have brought to people who maybe have played your basic um, Milton Bradley, Parker Brothers kind of games for most of their life or um, just like a lot of card games because we live in the Midwest and everybody around here has played Euchre, Spades, Hearts, um, Dutch Blitz for our Amish adjacent folks. So people that play those kind of games, um, but we want to introduce them to more like hobby games or, and then also games that, um, those kind of people can jump into because maybe there's a, a familiar mechanism or there's a familiar IP or um, they are easy for all different levels of people to join in. So that's the kind of thing when I think of gateway games, it's like these are games that are somehow attractive to people who have played like your generic family game night kind of games. Yeah, I agree. Um, I, I don't. I don't always call these gateway games. I just call them light games, I think. Lame games is what Jason calls them. No, I like a lot of these games on my list. But (laughs) when I think of gateway games, what I think of are games that I could play with people at our church or church camp that don't normally play games that I know I've played these games with and they've gone over well and some of those people have actually bought the games. True. So when I think of a gateway game or getting people into the hobby, these games that are on my list are ones that I know actually work and do what i think they should do so that's kind of why i put them on my list right and there are some that everyone out there will say oh yeah these are the games that got me into the hobby and we'll mention those later but the ones that we are talking about are games that we have brought to people that we know don't hardly know anything about any kind of board games beyond monopoly and they have gone over like gangbusters so jace you want to start sure uh so the first game i'm going to talk about is a game that i don't know people either hate it don't like it. I, I don't know. I think it's fun. It's a good time, and it's gone over pretty well for what it needs to do. And that game is called Bring Out Your Dead. Uh, this is a game from Upper Deck, and the reason that I like to use this is because it incorporates a couple like hobby game mechanisms pretty well. So you're going to be doing some... The way this game works is you're going to be playing some cards from your hand. Everyone's going to put it face down. You're all going to reveal at the same time. And based on the cards that you play, it's going to determine where you're going to be able to bury these dead family members that you have on one side of the river. So we, so that is simultaneous action selection, which is going to introduce people to a whole other world that they have never been a part of. And then you're trying to bury your family members on the side of the river to do some area control, which is also something that people aren't super used to. Um, so this is a super fun game. The theme is so macabre and just fun. And I know that sucks people in sometimes, too, because it's always fun to pretend like you're burying your family members on the side of the river or pushing them into the river. So it's a good time. It's gone over well with our church people, too, which I think is kind of funny. So my first one that I wanted to talk about is Bring Out Your Dead. There are people that hate this game? Yeah, it gets bad reviews on BGG, but, I mean, BGG is kind of snooty. So it's a hard, hard to tell if it really is getting bad buzz. Yeah, this game is great, and um, we've played with several families, actually, from our church group, and they think that the theme is hilarious, and, like, I love the little shaped coffin meeples, because you know I'm a sucker for that, but it's just kind of an unpredictable, funny, there's almost a shock value when we bring out the title, 
And that intrigues people to see, okay, what's this about? And then they start learning some like really key mechanics that can help them in future games. And I, yeah, it's great. It's a good game. I like it. We haven't played it in a while. We need to bust that out again. It has been a long time. So what do you have? That was my first one. What what good game are you going to hit us All with? All right. My first one is picked because I actually, we played this with my sister and my sister is like almost the antithesis of me. Like she wants to hate everything that I love just because sometimes I think she doesn't listen to this podcast. So it doesn't matter. <laughs> I can say whatever I want. Um, and she like, I'm an English professor. She's an accountant. This will be the one episode that she listens. I know, right? I doubt it. That'd be giving me way too much credit. She couldn't do it. I love my sister, but you know, we're different. So I actually, we took this game to play with her and her husband um, and they really liked it. And it's Dice Town. Um, Dice Town is Wild West setting, which a lot of people really love. Love our Westerns here in Merca. Um, Also, it is dice rolling. And Yahtzee is a game that, nearly everyone has played at some point or some variation of like what is what is that game we have a bunch of bunko and what's the game with a bunch of dice that everyone plays that you Tansy. like no you count like numbers up to like a certain number or something you roll and then you you can bust or something i don't know i'm, I'm giving her a blank stare because i have no <laughs> idea what she's talking about there you someone knows someone knows what i'm talking about it's like Yahtzee. That's all you had to say. Fine. Yahtzee and poker. There you go. Boom. Okay. Yes. So it is a mixture of Yahtzee and poker. So you have dice that are poker cards. So you're trying to make poker hands. And based on the hands you have, you are getting gold nuggets. You're getting money. You're getting um, more specialty cards that allow you to mitigate your dice. Um, you are getting land. There's just lots of different things that you can do and you're just trying to get as much as you can in order to be the winner. It's super simple. There's something so great about that. You, they come with these little dice cups and that sound of like shaking the dice and slamming them down. Everybody loves that. It's that kind of constant involvement of everyone, which keeps like players interested that, you know, aren't super into board games. It's two things that they have seen before on a regular basis and that most people enjoy. So, um, and this is like a Cathala Ma Blanc game. I mean, it is like yeah. got real chops. It's got some legit street cred. Uh, yeah, and the, one of the things that I really like about it is putting the dice in those stupid cups and slamming them down on the table. That's really fun. I know. I don't know why. It's just really satisfying, <laughs> and everyone loves it. It is satisfying. So that's that's my first recommendation is Dice Town. It's a good one. I didn't put that on my list, mostly because you put it on your list. And let's be honest, you told me what to put on my list. So. <laughs> I did. I did. But, I'm like, I picked these. You can get what's left. <laughs> so uh, the second game I'm going to talk about is actually a game that I like quite a bit. Uh, it's the first game in the Century Trilogy, and that's Century Spice Road. I actually think I like this better than all the other ones. My top 100 may have said differently, only because I sometimes get swayed by some of the new hotness. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I do really like the new one. It's really good. But there's something really satisfying about never buying more than two cards and being able to run your whole engine and winning the game with six cards. It's awesome. So if you don't know what this game is, it's an engine builder. Or I guess you could say a hand builder, maybe. Hand management, engine builder. Anyway, you're trying to get these cards that are going to give you resources or let you convert resources to try to get different colored cubes to be able to fulfill these goal cards that are out on the table for everybody to see. And they're all competing for them together. The first person to get a certain number of goal cards based on the number of people that are playing are going to end the game. And then whoever has the most points is the winner. That's the game. It's really easy to play. It's super fast, super easy to teach. Everybody that we played it with at my measuring stick of church camp has loved it. And a few people have actually went out and bought the game. So that's how I know this is a great gateway game. Probably one of the best ones actually on my list mostly because I enjoy playing it a lot. So Century Spice Road is my second game. And I think that another hallmark of a great gateway game for us is a game that we don't mind playing, even if it's with people that are beginners. Because there are sometimes, like, the reason Jason doesn't like party games is because he feels like they're just stupid. They're pointless. Like, there's nothing for me to do. Except for just one. Well, yeah, that's a whole different story. Um, But these gateway games, the ones that are really good, still give us, you know a sense of I am actually playing this game. I'm not just here to kind of hold these newbies hand along. I'm also invested in this game and I can enjoy playing it too. And Century is totally that way. The components are great. People always like the way it looks on the table and it really is easy for them to pick up. We have, we were sitting outside playing a game 
of it. And then some other people just walked up and like, oh, hey, what's this? So we're like, hey, sit down and play a game. They jump right in. They're into it. Um, they're telling other people. Uh, one of our friends like, oh, yeah, I bought this game for Christmas for my kids because I loved it so much. I want to play uh, with yeah, them. I forgot about that. Yeah, it's it's just a really great game. It's well done. Century. Awesome. And the artwork is gorgeous. I mean, this game is beautiful. Oh, shut up. It looks nice, okay? It does look nice. I care about that stuff. It doesn't really look that nice. It's the same artwork on like 92 cards. But I like that artwork. The colors are pretty. That's true. The colors are pretty, but it doesn't... The Gollum version does look nicer. I'll give it that. Okay. Well, and the thing is with Gateway Gamers, it is helpful to have a nice looking game. They're not going to be like, ooh, Marco Polo, what's that? It looks super Marco cool. Marco Polo is gorgeous. Oh you shut your mouth. I'm looking at it right now. It, it looks so stupid. Look at that I, guy. I could have drawn that guy. That guy is amazing looking. I could have drawn that guy, and I only draw sick people. All right, Katie's off the show. <sighs> Too late. <laughs> not, this is even worse, because like with Joel, you maybe could have gotten rid of him, but you stuck with me for life. That's true. Okay, so moving on to my next game. Um, Katie's still off the show. You will not survive through the night. You sleep very, very soundly, and I do not. Hmm. Katie's back on the show. <laughs> okay, my next game is um, a game that has some reminiscence of probably a game, a game we'll talk about honorable mentions um, that a lot of people have played, even if they are casual gamers. And my game is Royals. So Royals has like the car, slight card drafting that you get in Ticket to Ride, where you're pulling certain colors of cards and adding through your hand. Then you're doing the set collection thing where you are collecting these certain colors that match these different areas of Europe. So you've got like the British Isles, you've got Spain, you've got um, Germany, Brit, I don't know how you said France, British. France, Portuguese, Portugal too? Cuba, Brazil. Shut up. You know, your geography is terrible, so I'm not going to rely on you. Argentina, but- <laughs> Iceland. Stop. You're off the show. You can't kick me off the show. <laughs> Fine. You're muted. So in Royals, you are then collecting these color cards, making sets to then put them down and gain control in these different country areas. Um, and you're you're so you're essentially bribing these different nobles of different power. So you're having different amounts of influence. There's like three separate scoring sections. So you're constantly trying to move up, get more battle um, to take the diff- most different areas, the highest amount in each area. So it's introducing people to that set collection piece, which is pretty basic. And then the idea of area control. Um, and so there's like a nice player interaction. So people like, it. like it's not super mean, but you are like bumping people out and kind of taking places that they want. You know, you're starting like... And that people like that light kind of antagonistic take that nothing, you know, table flipping or anything by any means. And it's just it has some like fun little differences. It just it's that nice next step. So that's why I like Royals. And we've played this with several different groups, people, and they they do really enjoy it. Yeah, this is probably the meanest game of all the games that we've listed, even our honorable mention ones that we'll talk about. I mean, again, it's area control and area control is kind of mean. Uh, bring out your deck can be a little mean too when you take that final grave spot but yeah this one's true. i think this one might be meaner but it's shorter so it doesn't feel as bad right and i don't i hate area control like i really really do but i don't i don't mind it in royals because it's so fast it is like your turn takes like half a second and then you look down to do something and it's your turn again so yeah it's just it's nice and there are lots of different ways to kind of get some points even if you don't have like you're not in complete control of a certain area so I find that helpful to kind of mitigate some of the annoyance I get with area control. It's a good pick. Of course it is. I picked it. Yeah, you're right. And you picked mine too. So the next <laughs> game that you picked that I want to talk about is called, well, I'll tell you who it's by. It's by Uwe Rosenberg. So you got to feed people. So it is <laughs> the gateway game of all gateway games, Feast for Odin. Stop. Do you love this game more than Century Spice Road? Uh, I don't know if I love it. I I would rather play Century Spice. Well, the game is Bonanza, in case you didn't know that. <laughs> it's Bonanza. Uh, Beans. I like Century Spice Road better as a game, but I think I enjoy the experiences with Bonanza better. Hmm. So, one of the reasons why, well, of all the games that Katie put on this list that we kind of talked about and chose from, the reason I put Bonanza on the list is because we played this game at a church camp, like, hence my measuring bar again. <laughs> With a guy who doesn't play anything, any game, any fun games, he poo-poos on everything in life. Everything. Like, he's like the curmudgeoniest curmudgeon ever. 
Like if Eeyore were a person, but also like get off my lawn at the same time. Yeah, exactly. That's this guy. And he played this game. We told him how to play it. At first he had the poo-poo face on. <laughs> but then like halfway through, he started yelling at his wife, trying to make trades, telling her that like getting in, in the way of her making trades with other people, it was awesome. So he was playing the game you were supposed to play it. And that's what I love about this game is I don't like to do that stuff either, really. But I do it in this game because it's enjoyable. So Bonanza, is that's why I put it as the last one I wanted to talk about. Because I think of all the ones on this list that we've played, this gives me the best experiences. So Bonanza is, I'll say it's my number one gateway game. And we've played it a lot. And and it's not, it's one of those games that you will play back to back to back games. And you can draft new people in, people can leave. Um, but even if you just played it, you'll play it again because you're so into it. You're like, oh man, all the chili beans this time. You're like, try and do whatever you can to like get alliances. Like suddenly you turn to like some like mafia king that you're like, okay, I'll take this, per- I'll take one for you, but you got to do me a favor later, which I think is what Nate did. He's like, I will give you a long standing favor to be cashed in at any time. Yeah, it was extra game uh, favors, which I don't <laughs> think is how you're really supposed to play, but whatever. Yeah, but all different types of people. And we and there are a lot of different expansions to play it different ways. And we have a couple of them that are the lesser mean ones. And those have also gone over really well. Yeah, the babies are awesome. I do like the baby beans. Lady beans, baby beans. So yeah, that's my number. Well, I didn't give any of them numbers, but I'm just going to say that's probably my favorite gateway game. So Bonanza. Okay, um, my next one, I don't know if it's my favorite gateway game. I do like it a lot. I often suggest this game. So my game, last game to talk about is called Fool's Gold. This is like a really obscure game, I think. I don't know anybody else that's out there playing this game. And uh, yeah, and partially it gets bad reviews on the geek as well. So I don't know why. I don't know why people hate everything that has to do with luck. It kind of gets irritating. It has Eno Tool. Ian O'Toole yeah, art. It does. I mean, Eno Tool's everywhere now. It's legit. So this is that game from like 2015. We picked it up like at like a black friday sale or something for like ten dollars i think it was less than that it was super cheap yeah. five bucks i don't know it was and it turned out to be a really awesome game so in this game you are miners and you have certain little minor er work. not or miners not minors <laughs> I didn't say minors. I know. I'm just trying to, to specify. It's called fool's gold. I think people get that it's miners with pickaxes. Maybe it's a play on words. You don't know. So you think that because Joel's not here, you got to try and make jokes to be funny because there needs to be something to laugh at? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll know my place. I'll just be quiet. <laughs> That's right. Let me talk about fool's gold. So you are miners. It's the gold rush. And you have your own little workers each year. You play it over five years, maybe? Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. Something about that. Maybe about five years. Um, and each year you are able to add like a new miner and you get a little bit more money. So there are these different places that you want to mine. The river, the lake, um, the mountains, the valley, the hills. Maybe there's no valley. Forest. Over the hills and through the woods. I think there's a grandma's house. There's definitely hills because I always sing the hills are alive. Or No, I always say there's gold in them there are hills when there actually is gold. But the hills are not. Mountain, hills, river, forest, forest, and lake. lake. Yeah, yeah. So there's um, a type of gem at each of those ma- mine sites. There is different varying amounts of gold at each of those mine sites. And so you are bidding to put miners at these different sites. You can put multiple miners at each site to try and get more chance at gold. But the thing about this is, I think it's so thematic because there is a deck of cards for each mine site. And not only is there gold and gems, there's also silt because there's going to be a lot of dirt. There's also fool's gold because sometimes that happens. You think it's gold and it's not. Um, There's going to be bad weather, all the stuff that happens. So it's like it's the experience of mining without black lung, I guess, and the whole canary bit. I mean, you could get black lung if you play it in a mine. Well, I guess, but it'd be kind of dark. Hmm. I mean, if you're mining at the lake, I don't think you're going to get black lung. Because you're like panning for gold. Oh, I guess that's true. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, how much have you watched Gold Rush Alaska? A lot. Exactly. I love that show. Nobody's in a cave getting black lung in Gold Rush Alaska. <laughs> so, no guts, no glory. Stop. I knew you had to bring that up. I shouldn't even say anything, but I couldn't stop myself. So in Fool's Gold, I like it because people can kind of connect with that theme. Like, oh, yeah, Gold Rush. That's fun. And then there's that luck piece of okay i want to mine but oh oh man there's like three dirt cards and one gold card am i gonna be able to get it 
or okay, I didn't get any um, gold in this first round, so I'm going to winter here. I'm going to try it again. Or I'm like, oh, do I want the gold? Do I want the gems? Or oh, great, there's five of us here, and we got all dirt because that's what happens in mining. And I think that idea of kind of a little bit immersive, that thematic bit, people really like. And it's really simple. You place your miners, you turn over cards, you get gold, or you don't. And so that's why I really like to introduce Fool's Gold as kind of a worker placement introduction and just a little bit of a different kind of game. So Fool's Gold. Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, I like another Push Your Luck game better. And let's talk about some of those games that we like as well. Some of the, okay, so we're going to talk about some honorable mentions. And there are some on these honorable mention lists that I like better than the ones that I put on my list, but we've talked about them a right. lot, so, so I wanted to give some other games some love. Yeah, so okay. I'll go ahead and get started. I'll read a couple, then you can say okay. a couple. So the first game, of course, that we need to talk about is Ticket to Ride, because, I mean, that's essentially rummy with some trains, set collection. It's going to get you into set collection and some contract fulfillment, well, route fulfillment. And it's easy to play. It's easy to teach. It turns are fast and fun. So Ticket to Ride is probably going to be one of the highest rated gateway games For sure. of anything that we've talked about. It's everywhere. Everyone knows what mm-hmm. it is. There's 1,900 different versions of it. So go find the country that you like, and you can probably find a game of that version. So Quacks of Quedlinburg is another one that is probably my favorite of all the ones we've talked about. But... We, we had Fool's Gold as Push Your Luck, so we didn't really need Quacks as well. But I love Quacks. It's in my top 20 games of all time. The pulling stuff out of the bag is amazing. Uh, it was scratched that same itch as Fool's Gold. And it's easy. Like everybody yeah. I've played it with has had a good time. It's easy to teach, easy to play. Yeah. So that's Quacks. So I'll let you go. You can um, one of my and favorites then, is Mystery of the Abbey. Cool. And I didn't put it in my list because it is ridiculously hard to get a hold of because it's out of print. But it's a nice gateway game because most people have played Clue. And if people enjoy Clue, this is like um, souped up version of Clue. It's like Clue Deluxe. You can do extra things on your turn. You've got the little bell to signal mass. Like you've got extra cards that allow you to kind of subvert some of your rules. The question asking is more open. So I feel like there's a lot. And like you've got funny little monks. Like they're either short or they're either fat or they're skinny or they're bearded or unbearded or they're hooded or non-hooded brothers, friars. yeah franciscans brothers friars. yeah, yeah franciscans. it's just a fun a fun little like building up from clue um another one that i love to introduce to people is takanoko few people can resist the pull of that adorable little panda on the box and then when you open it up you got a little panda little gardener and those like chunky little bamboo things even my sister liked this game and again i mentioned that like she hates everything that i love She actually liked this game, and she thought, oh, you know what? I bet my sister-in-law would actually like to play this game. We should play it with her. And I was like, oh, my gosh. I'm going to convert you yet. (laughs) I wonder wonder if Captain Poopoo I don't know if he went him over. He would be like the grouchy gardener that's like yelling at the panda for eating the bamboo. Another big game that we have talked about on the show over and over again um, that is a great gateway game is Parks. It is so pretty. Number one. Shut up. Never heard. And Parks, heard of it. like, I think part of the pull for a gateway game is because it is so beautiful, because it intrigues people, it pulls them in, they're like, what is that? Ooh, that looks, look at that. Look at those little shaped meeple things. I mean, maybe that's just me, but, and then it's, it's simple. It's moving forward, moving your hiker forward and collecting some stuff and then fulfilling these park requirements. That's a pretty basic thing that you can teach to almost anybody. Yeah, that game is pretty on point. Probably up there with some of the best games that have worked well, I think. But again, we talk about it all the time. So one game we never talk about, other than we don't want to play it that much anymore, is Catan or Catan or Settlers of Catan, whatever you want to call it. And we actually have a version of this still. We have Star Trek because it has little USS Enterprises that are the roads, which is awesome. And all the goods are different. Nobody wants to play as Captain Kirk, which is great. Spock. I, I love Kirk. Spock. So that's a good game. Everybody knows this game. It's probably, maybe, it's, it's more popular than Ticket to Ride probably, yeah. but maybe barely. But yeah. Catan is... It's actually what got me into the into hobby gaming. was Catan. Well. Yeah, me too. I think... 
Well, I mean, I played. Well, I mean, like, I was playing like Risky Doctor stuff. Lucky and um, Bang, oh, a lo- long before that. But this oh, was like true. actual like a board because I played Kill Doctor Lucky when it was like still super cheap. And you had to provide your own stuff. It's the name of the company. Another bleep. I already said it's ready to eat. This podcast ready to eat oh, anyway. I just say everything I want. <laughs> Uh, so another game, which we've played a ton of, is Dice Forge. Uh, this is a newer game where you're creating dice by customizing the faces that you want to put on it. So it's a little more complicated to teach, um, but the nice thing about this game is you're mm-hmm. always playing. So on everybody's turn, you're rolling your dice, you're f- getting resources, you're getting gold. So you're never there's no downtime, which is really awesome. And the last one I'll talk about, and then you can take the rest. And that is for sale. Um, we picked this up at Origins this year. Well, yeah. I think. Yeah. Or, well, last year now. And this is just a simple auction game where you're trying to draft, pay for these houses or buildings. Some of them are better than others. It's two halves of the game. The first half, you're drafting these buildings. The second half, you're going to spend these buildings that you've acquired during the first half to try to get money. The goal of the game is you're trying to get a bunch of money. It's a simple auction game, bidding game. Everybody understands auctions and bidding. So this is putting that yeah, with the card, like which is both. kind of fun. Dice so Forge, I only sale. had one person complain that they didn't really like it. They said it was like really math heavy or something, which surprised me. I know. It has a track. I'm just telling you, you one person said it, they felt like it was mathy. It wasn't. He didn't. No, he wasn't. Poo-poo boy. He wouldn't even play it. Are you kidding me? Oh, yeah. We never Everyone else loved it. Right. Um, yeah. The game that really got me to thinking that we should spend most of our time playing board games is Splendor. And I think that has kind of fallen off because I think a lot of gamers think it's too simple. But as a gateway game, there's something really great about it. It just um, the chunkiness of like what you're handling. So you, you feel poker chips. Yeah, so people are familiar with poker chips, what they feel like, and then they it's not like an abstract idea to them for resources. They can see it and start moving things around. And it's that idea of, okay, here's set collection, here's contract fulfillment. That's just at a very basic level. And I actually would really love to play the expansions because I really enjoyed Splendor. We played it a lot, um, but I can't justify spending as much for an expansion as for the base game. You don't like spending 40 bucks for four pieces? You have corrupted me. Apparently. I love that. No. I love spending forty dollars for four pieces and twelve cards. Then go out and buy it for me. I don't love it that much. <laughs> That's what I thought. Um, another one, as far as deck builders go, a lot of people like to use Dominion as intro. I don't like it at all. So, and I we gave it away actually because I can't stand Dominion so much. But instead, I like to use um, Marvel Legendary because most people have some kind of connection to Marvel. They have a favorite character. For me, the X-Men were it. I grew up watching the cartoon in the 90s. I embarrassingly know way too much about that. Um, Or people grew up reading the comics, or they like the movies. And there's so many different expansions and factions to that, that you could find one to connect with someone, and then you just start teaching them the basic of, okay, here, you draw these cards in your hand, you play them, you draw new cards, you buy new cards. And it's kind of that semi-cooperative, so you can kind of help them in their plays because it's not really hurting you in your in game because you are, in a way, working together. And so for us, like sometimes that kind of cooperative aspect to a game can help ease new gamers in because they don't feel like they're just being thrown out in the cold, but they also have some agency in creating their own deck. Um, so that's why I like Marvel Legendary. And finally, a game that... Gosh, I don't know. I don't know anyone who could not like this game because if you don't like this man, you are Satan. I'm pretty <laughs> sure. Like, I, so uh, the final game I want to talk about is. <laughs> Stop. I mean, Satan might be a little harsh. Let's say you're just not a nice person if you don't like this guy. You're like Rasputin or something. Like, it's terrible. How can people not like Bob Ross? I have, I'm looking at my two little Bob Ross Funko Pops right now. So um, the last game is, what's the full name of that game? Bob Ross, The Art of Chill Game. Oh, The Art of Chill. Yeah, Brandon and Josie have it. Oh, no wonder I couldn't find it. The Art of Chill. It is such a great game because I'm pretty sure everyone knows Bob Ross and his adorable afro. And The Art of Chill, at first I was like, okay, this is like a hokey IP or whatever. 
It's really fun. It's basic, you know, set collection. I'm collecting these paints that go to these pictures. I'm collecting the paintbrushes. I need to apply it. And then you're also like, so you're rolling this dice to see what you can do. You get so many actions. Then there's Bob and there's a little Bob shaped meeple. And Bob is also painting with you. But you want to paint the picture before Bob does because you get more points. And then sometimes Bob's just chilling. And that's so great. Like, it's a relaxed fun game that anyone can enjoy. It's super simple to teach. And that nostalgia factor just really suckers people in. And so does Bob Ross's Afro. So Bob Ross, Art of Chill, definitely is a final game I want to talk about. Yeah, I like all these games. Every game that we've talked about on this list, I would play. I would probably play actually not in just a gateway scenario too. Maybe except for Splendor. I think I might be over that one. But it's still a fun game. I just... I'm looking around at the shelf. I see Space Explorers, which is better. Uh, I would just rather I would play another one of these games opposed to Splendor, but it does what it needs to do as a gateway game. So I do appreciate that as well. And you might notice missing off our game list is pretty much any type of party game, because for us that's a completely different thing. Party games, yes, I would say is a great kind of gateway game situation to bring people into games that don't normally play them. But that's kind of a totally different beast entirely because you're looking at big groups. You're looking at more like interactive kind of different experiences and not like your general tabletop mechanic. So we'll have to discuss party games some other time, which I'm sure Jason is so excited to talk about. Oh, yeah, I can't wait. I mean, I'm so stoked to talk about party games. We have a whole room dedicated to them. Oh, yeah. We're sitting in it right now. Jason sleeps on it. I'm sitting on a throne of party games right now. He's cradling Taboo to his chest right now. Taboo, True Colors, Scategories. Oh, man, I love those games. I'd rather play those than my number one game of all time. Stop. I really like those games. True or Pursuit? Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Let's just play just one. <laughs> wow. So that's that's why there's no party games on here. To us, it's a different beast entirely. Yeah, we also don't have any two-player-only games. We were going to talk about one, but I guess it got removed. Um, but there are a lot of two-player games that work pretty well as gateway games as well to maybe get a spouse or significant other involved in gaming it it works pretty well but two players is kind of a different thing too so well thank you guys um i don't know how this is gonna work and i'm gonna do my best to try and hang in there with jason um because he is awesome and i do kind of like sitting across my husband for an hour or so and talking about board games but we're still here. The Riveted's still here. Um, Joel's still hanging out. So uh, thank you guys for being the best group of podcast listeners ever. You guys are completely awesome. So amazing. We love you all. Um, and hopefully we'll bring more people into the gaming hobby. So if you can think of gateway games we missed, stuff that's worked for you, I think the best kind of gateway games are not the ones that everyone labels and everyone knows, but the ones that you've tried out with your friends and have converted them. So um, go out to The Riveted. Find us. If you're not part of that group on Facebook, hashtag The Riveted. Just request, and it's real easy. Yeah, most people don't even answer the questions. So, I mean, that's how laid back it is. Right. It's we'll one question. You. It's what's your favorite game? You can't answer the question. It's not even what's your favorite game. It's or what, what have you game been playing? Yeah, what have you What game playing? would you play right now? If yeah. you could play any game, what game would you play right now? See, I don't even get a look at those answers because people don't answer the questions. I don't even know what the question is. So it's real easy. So join that and tell us what are some of your um, best gateway games. And I think we're going to wrap this up. Yep. I think um, I'm tapped out. All right. Well, I have not been Joel, but I've been Katie. And I'm Jason. And keep gaming, guys. Keep gaming.